Jeremiah chapter number 2. Jeremiah chapter number 2. Amen. I just, you know, I just, this is just where I'm at tonight. We need truth. Brother David, you hit the nail on the head when you said we can build the church. Let me tell you, as a pastor, sometimes you're tempted to do a lot of things. But you have to reflect, you have to pray, you have to be led by the Spirit to make sure that what you're doing is Christ-centered and Holy Ghost orchestrated. We're not looking just to build a number, but we're looking to build the kingdom of God with truth. Amen. So uh, this, this is the word of God tonight. The Bible says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. Number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. He goes into the second evil. He said, And they have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Amen. Here it is that, that, that Jeremiah the prophet, he gives a good illustration of the spiritual condition that was taking place in his day, but it still is applicable for the illustration of the spiritual condition that is taking place even today, amen, when people reject the fountains or the wells of living water and uh, they trade them in for broken cisterns, amen, which are, which are, which are perilous, which are totally unsatisfactory, but, but, but they trade the living water in for that. And so uh, 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 as we look at this, we find that here that, that, that when a person forsakes God, amen, and all the answers that are found in the Word of God, and they trade it in for philosophy, they trade it in for something that's more appeasing to the flesh, uh, when, they, when they forsake the Word of God, and they, uh, they resort to these humanistic philosophies, amen, it can be defined as nothing else but turning from living water and drinking from broken cisterns. How does that apply to us tonight? How do we look at that? You know, we've just come through that very holy time of year. And I, 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 I love Easter. And I look at that as we looked over the past uh, two weeks and we think about how the Christ was rejected. Go with me for a little bit. I am getting somewhere. How is it that people can reject Jesus Christ? They rejected Him and they accepted Barabbas. That meant that they wanted Jesus to be crucified and they wanted Barabbas back into their, their society. How could this be? I mean, here is Jesus Christ and who is doing all these wonderful things and there's a Barabbas, Brother Rick, who is a nuisance to society. He is a, a, a no good uh, individual that when you are around him, there's nothing edifying. You can't have the safety of your home and, and the things that you have. It can't be kept in safety before for a man named Barabbas. He's a wicked man. He's an evil man. And so how is it that people can trade in Jesus Christ for Barabbas? You know, it's, it, 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 it's something to think about tonight. People wanted to be around Jesus and everywhere he was, there was large crowds. But, but Sister Sandy, it was difficult times to get to Jesus. Sometimes, my friend, it is difficult to get to Jesus. There are barriers to be uh, 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 pushed over. Amen. Uh, there are some trees to climb. There are some roots to, 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 to tear apart. Amen. To get to Jesus. And so here it is that Jesus, uh, it, it was that, that, that you read in the book of Luke chapter number 19. It was difficult to get to Jesus. And so this little short man, he climbed up a tree just so he could see Jesus. 
And then we find recording in Mark chapter number 2 and Luke chapter number 5 that, that there were some men who wanted to get to Jesus and get their loved one to Jesus, but they couldn't get there. It was difficult. So they took the rooftop and they tore it off so that they could get in to Jesus. There were those who gathered around the lake and, and they couldn't even hear the teachings of this man who taught wonderful things because the crowd was too big. So Jesus uh, uh, used the acoustics of the water and he went out to the lake and he began to teach and preach so that folks could hear. But sometimes it's just difficult to get to Jesus. Even Luke records in chapter number 8 verse number 19 that, that Jesus' mother and brother I had a very difficult time getting to him. It was a popular thought. He was a man who did good things and great things happen when you're around him. But what happened? That the world would cry for the release of Barabbas and trade in this wonderful man named Jesus who was worth going to extremes to get to. Well, the word of God is very clear. When we look at Matthew chapter number 27 and Mark chapter number 5 verse number 11, you'll find that the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd that they should release Barabbas and crucify this Jesus. Now I'm thinking where the rubber meets the road. Why did I say all that? Because we live in a world where everybody wants to be ecumenical. Everyone wants to accept everything and everybody. Amen. Everybody wants to uh, you out a new sister when Jesus Christ said, I am the living water. Amen. Come and drink at the well. It is deep, but this well that you drink at, amen, you drink of this water, you will never thirst again, Brother David. But the world is crying out, we need something new. We need a new sister. Look at what we can do to, to hold the water. Amen. Forget about that, that, that well. We need something else. Amen. That is the spiritual condition of the day and age in which we are living, where there's all kinds of sisterhoods that are hewn out, but Christ is calling us back to the well where He talked to the woman who was committing adultery. He talked to her and He said, I will give you water that you'll never thirst again, and for whosoever will, come and see a man who told me everything that I've ever done, and come and see a man who allows you to drink in a well that is much better than the well that was given to us by Isaac and Jacob. And so here it is. Sisters. Sisters. I need to tell you that there's no place like drawn the well of Jesus Christ. Because when I first look the flavor of the sister is different than the flavor of the well. Part of my crudeness, but when I was growing up as a boy in West Virginia, we worked in the hayfield. That was our summers. We worked in the hayfield. So, Brother Craig, you're probably familiar with that while you're out there and you're cutting this hay and all of that dust is flying up and you're breathing it in and you're in the hot sun and you're sweating and you're working. Brother David, there's nothing like a drink of water. And uh, we had on two ends of our properties, we were blessed to have some wells that came out natural springs out of the ground. Brother Dennis, on one well, there was a great big cement uh, 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 barrier that was built that was a cistern. It was nothing more than this concrete place that the cows could come and drink from. And so uh, uh, there would be uh, spring water running in there, but in the summertime, you would see the algae in there. Uh, you would see that it would be growing stuff in there. But there was nothing for me like going to either that well or the other well. And the other well, the base of the mountain, that was my favorite. I had to run it down the hill. And there was a pipe coming out of the hill, and, uh, and there would be an old uh, barrel or, or, or at times maybe even a bathtub, an old bathtub where this water would be running into. And I'll guarantee you, I never drank from the bathtub. And I never drank from the barrel. I never drank 
from the uh, uh, the, the concrete uh, block a uh, 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 cistern that was there. But there was something that I would do. I would get down and I'd hang on that pipe and I would just put my mouth up where that fresh spring water was running out of the mountain. Then there is nothing in the world like the taste of that spring water. You can call me crazy, but until you experience that bottle of water, as good as they flavor it, will never taste like that fresh, cold spring water running out of the mountain on a hot summer day. It's wonderful. So, what I like in this, amen, the flavor of water, the water from cisterns are lousy. Amen. I, I know that we live in the world where, where there's all kinds of human philosophies and there's all kinds of ideas that are contrary to the Word of God or someone's interpretation of the Word of God that's twisted and, and cracked around whatever they want to, to believe where it's watered down. But there is nothing for the soul like the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Amen. Where we come into God's house, where we come into God's presence, where we get in the Word of God and we just begin to drink. Amen. Uh, uh, that, that fountain, there's something about that taste. It's not stagnant. Amen. It's not warm, but it's cool. It's refreshing. When you go to those, those barrels or that, that block cistern, Brother, Brother Rick, I want you to know that that water was warm and nasty. But when you drank from the spring, it was cold and refreshing. Folks, I want to ask you tonight, where are you in your life? Amen. Are you you and out cisterns? That there's not a good taste to the drink? Amen. Or are you at the fountain? Amen. The way you choose Jesus Christ over anything of this world. Amen. The way your mouth is being quenched by, by the goodness of Christ and a fountain that He provides for us. Or are you feasting on the things of this world? Amen. We, 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 we often think about, amen, uh, the idols in which uh, God uh, spoke to uh, the children of Israel and, and His people throughout the Word of God. Oftentimes, there was wealth associated with that. There was pleasure associated with that. Uh, are we bowing down to those idols? Amen. Is it more important? important for us uh, for financial things more than that they are spiritual things. Are there a greater hunger for that of pleasure more than that of the pleasure of coming to God and worshiping Him above everything else? Amen. God help us. God help us. See, because the flavor of the cisterns, there's that constant, abundant Supply. If you understand what cisterns are, cisterns were meant to catch rainwater. My mom's still back on, at home. She she loves to put a bucket underneath her her uh, her her rooftop and where it drains off. I'm not too crazy about that. You walk by and all these little bunks are floating in there, and you know it's disgusting. But she, you know, it's the way she waters her plants sometimes. Brother David, you better guarantee me, I ain't drinking out of it. None of us would do it physically, but unfortunately, we allow our soul to be spiritual. Drink from places that are stagnant, where there's not a constant, running, abundant supply. Amen. We, we, we trade in the sufficiency and strength of God for artificial things that can never, ever help us. Amen. Uh, the, the place where our, our thirst can be uh, quenched. Amen. Nothing like the well of living water. Not only is it the flavor of the cistern, but the filthiness of the cistern. I've somewhat spoke of that. Where you look at that catching the uh, uh, roof and uh, the, 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 the storm, you know, uh, that which flows in the cistern really is very filthy where there's germs and bacteria and all types of filth in the water. Amen. And that, that, that are sinners. I want you to know that that's what it can do to the soul as well. Where we drink can be a bacteria to the soul. When it's something that is filthy, 
that something just left for pleasure. That something beyond the holiness of God. Amen. It's not wholesome. It's not healthy. It's interesting. When I was looking up sister, and so I, I, I Googled it, and Brother Dennis, do you know that's what the back of our tournament is called? The sister? Now, in Bible school, there were some guys that got real smart. On Sunday night, they didn't sell anything. At the store, the store was closed. You couldn't go anywhere. So these guys would buy things, and they'd sell them. Brother David, this guy was selling cold soap. His house he keeping the soap was cold. So one day, Brother Craig, they found that in the bathroom, in the back of the toilet, stacked up all these cans of soda. He was selling these cans of soda to make a profit. It wasn't something I wanted to drink from. The soda or the water. What do we do to our soul? Because it's convenient or seems convenient. I want you to think about something. The Bible says that these are broken cisterns. Cisterns require something. They require for us to use them. They require for us to build them and make them. There's two things that we can find here. Number one, we'll never be able to fabricate anything that's close to what God has already fabricated and created for our soul. Amen. We won't be able to do it. The second thing is, it is work. God's design was not for us to have to work for, but God's design was provision for us. Amen. He's providing for us something that is a quenching for our soul. You folks know what it's like in life to experience those hot days where it's exhausting, where your soul just needs something to satisfy it. Amen. God already planned and designed a living water that is flowing. Amen. That would satisfy the very depth of your soul. Amen. And, and today the message is still the same that Jeremiah preached. My people have created two evils, committed two evils. They have forsaken the living water. And number two, they have built for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns. They haven't even proven themselves effective, but still man uses them. God help us to stick with what God has provided that is effective and proven. So the filthiness of the cisterns, but I already talked a bit about the failure of the cisterns. They didn't have a good job of holding the water. They were broken. They were not satisfactory. The Word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter number 12, the pleasures of sin are but for season. You know what? There's pleasure that's there, but it's short-lived. And so folks oftentimes will find themselves we're living in the pleasure of the moment, forsaking the living waters and finding themselves broken cisterns. It only satisfies and tastes good for a moment, but it's quickly gone. I'm not talking about the world who's living in sin. I'm talking about the church who's trading in the fountain of a living water for things that are less than. Amen. And God looks at it and He says, I'm grieved by it. Yeah, I, I, the church, my people are committing two evils. They forsake it and they're building something else. Amen. I need to tell you that the Word of God says, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore in the kingdom of God, the water that He provides, it lasts forever. Not temporary, but forever. Christ, He satisfies the soul like none other. And what He provides, there's nothing broken about it. But it's everlasting. In closing this week, when I was at a conference, I was enthralled by just a man who, who came to us from France uh, by telecommunications, and there he was, and he was presenting his PowerPoint, and he was talking, and just an amazing man. You heard his story. He was a, 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 a chaplain for seafarers. Never knew such a thing existed. Un, un, unheard of to me. But in, in this world, 
where trade is. Trade has been around for a long time. And uh, there are 50,000 ships that are sailing that do nothing but uh, that the, the execute trade throughout the world. So I found that to be very interesting. Interesting enough that of those 50,000, do you know that America only has 100 of those ships? Wow. And so as, as, as men and women are on the sea and they're in a crew where, where, where they are a, a small crew and uh, they actually work six hours on, six hours off, unless there's a storm and some of them may work more hours than that. There's no medical personnel, so there's one person who's trained to take care of everyone. And, and, and so uh, 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 as they're out there, most oftentimes there's no telecommunications. There's no way for them to communicate with their family. And they're gone from six to nine months in stint. And it's crazy to believe. It's hard to believe that most of our fruit that we get and we'll eat. I mean, just give me a little education. It was, it was neat for me to hear. Most of all the fruit that we eat comes into Philadelphia, and then it is uh, nationwide spread out. But it comes in there, and there it's taken off of the boat, and then it's taken to various places. But, but as, uh, as, as this man was talking and he was sharing about how important it is uh, to, to have chaplains. And so these men meet these seafarers uh, when they come into port. And one of the things that they use is hospitality to be able to share the gospel with them. And so they'll take a hot spot and they'll give it to this, uh, these gentlemen and they'll be able to, to communicate with their family via Skype or however it is, uh, log on Facebook to be able to get communications that they have. I'm not had for a very long season, and then be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And so, as 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 he was sharing, there was something that that stood out to me that that, that made the the wheels of my mind turn. We're very familiar with the fracking and and the gas that is being uh, 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 pro uh, produced uh, within Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. Those three states are producing a lot of gas. And so they take this product and their special boats that are designed for this gas. They put them on these ships and uh, they'll put them, they'll, they'll take that gas and they'll put it down to a temperature that is just phenomenal uh, and it's uh, uh, degrees below zero. And where it's going, its destination will take that gas. And you know what they'll change that gas into? Plastic. Plastic. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about drinking my bottle of water, there's something inside of me that says, since hearing that, she's the gas. Harvest it from the ground. It just doesn't sound like it's the healthiest option. Not that I'm not going to drink from there, okay? But we know we have a problem with plastic. There's a real problem in our society. Uh, plastic and the, 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 the getting rid of it. But then, I also heard this weekend that marathons, I believe it's in England, that they are doing something different for their runners. Instead of putting the water in plastic, that they're taking the water and putting it in seaweed packets. Now, I know seaweed might sound, I think, if I had a drink and think something was more natural and taking care of my body, I could go with the seaweed of plastic. I'd still rather have that spray coming out of my mouth. Because I think within both contexts, there are things that we initially cringe at. But that's what the church and God's people. We go through a lot of work. We go through a lot of effort to satisfy the depth of our soul with other things than the fountain of living life. And when God looks down, He says, My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken the fountain of living life. And they view themselves as sisters. 
I want to challenge us tonight. How valuable is the fountain to you? Things that get the presence and the power and the word of God in your life. We live in a day and age where people's value of church attendance is low. Not you folks, you're here tonight. Thank you. It shows the value. And I'm not throwing stones at everybody. Some folks just need to learn the value. It's not that they're intentionally doing it. But the heart of God still wants them to find the living water. Our understanding and allowing the Word of God to be a part of our daily lives. Are we allowing the well to flow? Or are we going to a cistern somewhere else? We have lots of resources in our hands. We have movies with phenomenal types of, uh, of all, uh, all types of uh, uh, just um, uh, graphics that, that, that can make you say, wow. We have music like we've never had before. We have communications where we can be in touch with other people more than ever before. We have all types of resources to make an extra buck for our pocket. Amen. We have all types of resources to be able to gain goods for ourselves. Have we in cisterns that are more important than being at the living water? Have we? I'm talking from the pulpit to the pew. Have we? Are we forsaking? How does the heart of God feel when He looks at us? Is He pleased? Because He sees us just like He did an old country boy with His arm wrapped around the pipe coming out of the mountain just enjoying the cold, fresh spring water? Or does He look and see that someone is drinking out of that warm, putrid cistern that was never designed to be drunk out of. But it was something that we built. God didn't build it. <clears throat> and so tonight, I just simply want to ask, where are we? Are we in the strength and the grace and the power of God? Or have we traded it in for temporary things that are unproven and broken? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Sister Bethany, you come to the piano. Tonight I want you to evaluate where are you drinking? And with the sister, would you repent and say, God, I'm so sorry for you in a different place. For going after temporary things that only bring a temporary pleasure. God, here I am. I'm back at the fountain of the living water. And here is where I stay. Would you gather in tonight as you make evaluation and as you make a fresh commitment to